Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Laurie Leyburn. Laurie is a policy researcher and author. He leads Cohort 2040, which explores how to deepen rapid action towards a more sustainable and equitable world, even as the effects of the environmental crisis get far worse. He's a visiting fellow at Chatham House and at the Global Systems Institute in the University of Exeter, as well as an associate fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research. He's a regular commentator on TV and radio and co-author of Planet on Fire. As COP27 kicks off, Laurie joined me to discuss the kinds of policies that we need in order to tackle the climate crisis, from national policies to international policies. He explained how the climate crisis could be tackled through fiscal policies and how our sort of fiscal ideology is massively limiting our ability to respond effectively to the climate crisis. We discuss eco-nativism, the kinds of environmental policies which are all about securing one's own individual nation rather than taking account of the whole of the globalized world that we live in. And we discuss how international cooperation is the bedrock of any effective policy going forward. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. So, Laurie, thank you so much for joining me uh, on Planet Critical. It is a pleasure to have you on the show, and I'm really grateful to have you on during COP. It's my absolute pleasure to be here with you. Could you give a brief background um, of yourself so that listeners can kind of know why you have an authority to speak on the things that I want to speak on? <laughs> I mainly worked in, uh, in, in policy world. So I've done a lot of work in think tanks, in policy research organisations, looking at, at what the implications of the environmental crisis are for politics, for policymaking, and then what kind of policies we need to realise the huge transformations to our economies, which we know are needed to avoid the very worst. Um, so it's that policy world that I come from, but I've also been involved with various things, activism, and I, I also, um, for, for, for the sins, I'm often on the news as well, providing commentary on some of the big issues uh, at the moment, including things like COP. Yes, I've seen you. You're very, you're very good. You manage to sort of stay calm in the face of misinformation and, frankly, idiocy at times, even from professional journalists, which, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do. So hats off to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of, one of the things is that um, there's, a, there's a kind of a strategy to get a rise out of people who are clearly mm -hmm. concerned about the environmental crisis. Um, and if you can avoid that, I think you can do quite well. Another side of this, I think, is that there is still a lot of confusion and anxiety about the environmental crisis, not just what it could do to the world, but what the transition could do to mm. people's lives. So I really enjoy being in, uh, in media spaces on, on certain networks and so on, where I'm getting more of that type of feedback as well. And people are, of course, really concerned about, if we talk about the UK where we are uh, today, about the, the costs to them of having to transition to a different type of car, to an electric vehicle, say, or away from a gas boiler and so on and so forth. And the point that I make is that there are, there's a different, you know, there's a certain type of net zero that pushes a lot of that cost down onto individuals and kind of says, look, this is a massive problem, but at the end of the day, it's up to you as individuals to work, that, work with that. And, and it's those kind of policies that will push it onto people, that will set them further against each other and will ultimately lead us to a situation where people become suspicious, untrustworthy or opposed to transition. So I think it's really important to get into some of those spaces where you see more of that mm. type of anxiety alongside the other types of anxiety that I think we often experience in the environmental world, the anxieties of what it's already doing to the world and could do into the future. 
I think even that term anxiety in that space is quite interesting though, because um, obviously people are ge genuinely very, very anxious um, about what an unknown world could be. And yet, you know, the journalists who are presenting the morning news um, do not have to experience those same anxieties. Would you say that there is this sort of divisive rhetoric in order to separate sort of the labor movement and the green movement, you know, the working class from the middle class in order to sort of save the status quo for as long as possible? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm, I won't I won't point my finger at particular journalists, but I'm sure some people can guess who they might be. But yes, it's become something along the lines that you describe, another a uh, type of weapon to be deployed in an increasingly divisive type of politics. It, it, many of those who wish to kind of delay action have cottoned on to the fact that the type of action we need is hugely transformative, is going to realise huge differences to societies above and beyond what have happened at any point in, well, in, in living memory. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, point to anxieties about what that could mean instead of accepting what we all know could happen, which is those transformations could be beneficial to pretty much everyone and deal with the problems that we were suffering from anyway, independent of the environmental crisis, like inequality, like, you know, low standards of living, increasing impacts upon mental health of the way that society is organized and so on. So yeah, it, it is of course being used hugely divisively. Those anxieties about the impacts of the transition on one's life, I think will increasingly be used uh, in that kind of way, unless we do get policies that deliver a transition that really maximizes those benefits for people and makes their homes warmer through better insulation, that makes it easier to access certain opportunities through better transport and uh, decreases inequality and other things that are causing all sorts of problems in societies around the world. Mm. But I suppose from a policy level, how do you enact those policies a in the world that we currently exist in and then b in the right order and what i mean by that is something that people say a lot on this show is the great sort of entanglement of the poly crisis or the meta crisis or the multiple crises energy economic climate etc um is that in order to sort of solve them they've become so enmeshed now we need to be able to do multiple things at the same time pull all of the different levers essentially otherwise if we just focus on one area we'll let another drop mm. um and so it demands transformation in many areas, in many fields, all at the same time. From a policy level, I mean, how do you go about crafting policies that can achieve that or communicating that at least to policymakers so they can start to web and weave policies together, which have typically been siloed into different areas? Yeah. I am a big believer that proper policy change, uh, and by that I mean ones that go against the grain, changes that go against the grain are probably what's been dominant over the period of say 30 or 40 years. Those changes only really come about in moments of massive crisis. Uh, in some ways, I think we could think of policy or political change as uh, really happening at points of competing nightmares. Um, hmm. We've seen this in the UK, say, where you had and there's a brilliant book that touched on this by a BBC journalist called Phil Tinlight called The Death of Consensus. I'd really recommend having a read of this. But um, let's take the, the, the pre-Second World War period in Britain. The big nightmare sitting over policymaking then and politics by extension was that if the government got too big, spent too much money, helped too many people that needed it, then it would become bankrupt or authoritarian or would create this increasing, increasingly large underclass of dependent, people who are dependent upon the state. In fact, all three of those together in some massive contorted nightmare of a kind of overbearing state, right? Then a new nightmare began to came, come along, and that was the nightmare of mass unemployment, which resulted from the Wall Street crash and the financial crisis in the 1930s. Now, that new nightmare wasn't competitive enough against the old nightmare of the overburdening, overburdened state. And that's probably, arguably, because the country was even less democratic then, and elites who were in charge sort of dismissed this problem of mass unemployment out of hand. But then a new, new nightmare came along, which was the nightmare that Hitler could invade Britain and destroy the country. And mm -hmm. those two new nightmares, the one, the nightmare of mass unemployment, the, the threat of, of Nazism, they joined together in people's minds and they had the same solution, which there was, there necessarily had to be an expansion in state capability, that it had to 
um, intervene in the economy, to plan it, to make sure it could fight both total war and to deal with mass unemployment. I think that we are in a similar moment now where you're getting this crashing together of an old set of nightmares with then a newer set of nightmares, particularly around the environmental crisis. So it's really in those moments of dislocation, in those moments where elites seem to be out of touch with the generally shared nightmare that people are experiencing day to day, that you're able to drive that faster policy chain. And in this current moment, that newer nightmare, the one that is more broadly shared by the general population than it is by people in elite positions and so on, is the nightmare of the cost of living shock, at least in countries like the UK. And those in the rest of the world who are on the front line of the climate crisis, it's the nightmare of the lived experience of those worsening shocks. So in both those different contexts, UK or in uh, places in the global south, there is this opportunity now to be driving that much faster policy change that handles that newer nightmare. Taking the UK example again, it's in this moment that we, we could, should, and I hope be able to drive through not just policies like insulation and changes to how we use energy, which will deal with a number of those different issues of the poly crisis, the climate bit with emissions, the health crisis with air pollution, and the crisis of living standards with people not being able to afford to uh, or make choices between heating and eating. Mm -hmm. It will also hopefully unlock kind of enabling policy change. And by that, I mean the policies that would enable us to have massive insulation and change our energy system. And they include getting rid of artificial constructs of, of the debt and deficit that hold back the government investments that we need. Okay, I want to go more into the debt and the deficit. Uh, finance is not something we talk about a lot on the show, apart from outside of green finance. It's something I know very little about. I would love to um, know more coming mm -hmm. from you. But there's just one point on that before we go there. Like Boris Johnson earlier this week, um, for some reason, they have let him go to talk. <laughs> It is. It's baffling, they couldn't stop right? them, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. They could just stop him becoming PM again. They couldn't stop him going to COP. And he sort of said this offhand thing of like, oh, yes, well, you know, it's terrible that, uh, you know, we in the UK commit to contribute to so many emissions, but we just cannot afford to pay climate reparations. We yeah. cannot afford to pay loss and damages, which for listeners, loss and damages is a kind of climate finance where global North countries pay global South countries for the losses and damages incurred by climate crisis. Um, and yet yeah, he's sort of saying, you know, we can't afford to do that. And I think that that is, you know, what do you do when you have a cost of living crisis at home and there is this sort of scarcity mindset around money, yeah. even though there's bloody loads of it in the world. And then you've got your politicians saying, well, we shouldn't be sending money to sub-Saharan Africa because we've got to look after our own, even though they're not. And the climate crisis is still bearing down on everybody. It's hitting the global south first, but if we don't do something, it's mm. going to come to us, you know, mm. quicker and quicker, exponentially quicker. I mean, what do you do in that in that scenario? I mean, I think we we have to use the people's experience of COVID and then mm. the experience of, say, the cost of living shock now to draw on the fact that they, that may have got them to think about how, in an interconnected world, crises in one place are also your concern. Um, at COP27 in Egypt, which is happening right now, the, the Pakistan, Pakistan's national stand, their delegate stand, which they have in the conference center, has got a load of imagery like they all do. Think of like a sort of careers fair. And on their imagery, it says, what happens in Pakistan does not stay in Pakistan. Yeah. This is really useful framing because it helps us understand that in a world of worsening climate shocks, where some countries are left to the most severe, to, to the impacts of those severe shocks, the result in crises of impacts on food production, on things like forced displacements, on potential conflict, in a globalized world, they do not stay in one place. They ripple out to our interconnected systems in the way that COVID started off as a crisis of an infectious disease, and it became a crisis of economics, of, of social crisis, of political crisis, and so on. And in the way that uh, the, the barbaric invasion of, of Ukraine by Putin started off as a military engagement and then became a problem of food mm. shortages, of, of a migration problem, and so on and so forth. So we have to understand that the arguments for, for, for loss and damage payments shouldn't just be made in moral terms. That is, of course, very important, and they are right to be made in moral terms, because the countries who are experiencing the shocks are the ones who've caused the less emissions and 
uh, who, are, who are more vulnerable to their effects. But it's also a pressing practical reality that we need to help those countries. Because if they are more secure, if people have higher living standards, if they are better able to handle the unfortunate and inevitable sorts of climate crisis, then these kind of crises will not ripple out and impact us ultimately. So it's that we are as strong as our weakest member is something that helps mm. the COVID, definitely holds the climate crisis. Mm. And yet, <laughs> that's interesting, right? The, what is the weakest member in that analogy? You know, is it the nation that is uh, a third world nation that has been sort of deliberately exploited and underfunded? Or is it, you know, these global North allies who refuse to take responsibility and refuse to invest in sort of the world's long-term future? Who is the weakest member? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, depending on how you think about it. And I, I think, you know, mm. another, another question to ask about the sort of the, the people who are most exposed and vulnerable, they are in some of the wealthiest countries as well, the ones who mm -hmm. might think, oh, you know, the climate crisis is still over there in Pakistan or in the future, you know, oh, it's, it's hitting Pakistan right now, but it will be a long time before it hits up. That's just not the case. I mean, if you live, say, in the US, uh, a country that is, of course, committed, you know, committed some of the greatest number of emissions into the atmosphere, communities, particularly low-income communities, particularly communities, uh, black communities, are experiencing this disproportionately. And so exposure and vulnerability to the climate crisis aren't just things that exist in the global south. Of course, that is more severe there. And they're also not things that we in a connected world can be isolated from, even if we're not on the front line within a given country. Absolutely. So what kind of policy should we be looking for at COP27? And then also, I mean, what kind of policies should we be looking through? at COP27? Mm. What can we expect that is purely greenwashing? Well, I think the, the, related to what we were just talking about, the biggest ones are the financial transfers that need to be made to mm. countries who are most exposed, most vulnerable, who contribute the least and who have relatively less resources to handle it. Uh, the wealthy stations in the world committed 100 billion US dollars uh, to be given a year by, I think it was 2020, that commitment was made Long ago in 2009, at the COP then, that promise was not fulfilled, it's still not being fulfilled, and hopefully <laughs> we will get to the point, not just where that is fulfilled at this COP and is actually delivered, but is, has to be markedly increased because yeah. the impacts are getting worse and worse and worse, and has to be not just given in loans, the kind of old playbook, the, what, what's called the Washington Consensus Playbook of marching into country and saying, we will give you development aid. This was happening in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. But it will be loans, very expensive loans. And for you to receive those loans, we will force you to do certain things. We will force you to privatize your public services, for example. And, and then they will have to be provided, those public services have to be provided by Western companies. That playbook has got to go out the window. And instead, it's got to come with a different way of supporting, a different way of providing that $100 billion or more dollars a year, providing grants making sure that it's about building capacities locally. You know, we don't want to we don't want to just give countries money so they can buy Western technologies. We want them to develop the capacities for them to do that themselves. And then on top of all that, that 100 billion, which is largely about helping countries get greener and get better adapted, get more resilient to shocks. We need this additional fund for loss and damage, as you were describing those, that kind of the, the cost already incurred of, inev of inevitable impacts on the climate crisis. And that's got to come on top. That's got to really be compensation from countries that, that basically say, well, look, we have become very wealthy from pouring carbon into the atmosphere. That carbon has then led to a rise in temperature and all these horrendous things that are happening to your countries. You didn't put so much carbon in the atmosphere. You are not, therefore, as wealthy. So we're going to have to give you some of that money. And again, the argument for that has got to come in terms of uh, the practical imperative of doing that, not just the moral one. But I think the 100 billion, we're you know, looking increasingly likely that that will happen. It's questionable whether it'll be done under this new playbook. So it's not about loans and in imposing conditions on countries. That's a bit doubtful. The loss and damage thing, even though it's the big agenda at the moment, doesn't look so hopeful. Wealthy nations yeah. are basically saying, we'll talk about it, but we're scared about becoming liable for stuff that happened yeah. in the past. Yeah. I think another interesting um, angle on this is the kind of irony of 
these international conferences where all of these countries and world leaders and neighbors get together to talk about essentially, or it seems to talk about um, how to cooperate, how to collaborate. And yet outside of those conferences, we have huge geopolitical tensions right now. Uh, the United States and China, two world superpowers, you know, what's going on with like the tussle over Taiwan and semiconductor chips, which would throw us back into a sort of technological dark age if one got the um, monopoly on it. Um, and what's going on with Russia and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, given the tension and given sort of the increasing bravado of these nations and the uh, messages that are being implied, are we likely to see money being funneled away from security and from the potentiality of being able to defend oneself or attack a perceived enemy as well at this time? I th well, I think this touched on a really important general point, which is, um, Let's put it like this. I think over the last, I don't know, three or four decades, the way that action on the environmental crisis has been framed is akin to this, right? Imagine we're both on a boat, a figurative boat, and on the horizon there's a massive storm. And the challenge for environmentalists was to persuade people that that figurative storm on the horizon existed, and then to persuade governments and others to introduce policies that would change the course of that ship. And then, hey, presto, all would be well because the ship would sail around the figurative storm, would, you know, emissions would be reduced and the climate crisis wouldn't overcome us. We know over the last 30 to 40 years that the course was not changed enough. And now the figurative boat is in that storm. The world is now above 1.1, maybe hitting 1.2. We could be going over 1.5 on the current trajectory soon. And when you're in the storm, the figurative storm, the first challenge still remains. You've got to get away from it, right? Right, so it'll mm. overcome you. But it's joined with the second challenge which is that your ability to steer is increasingly frustrated by the impacts of the storm hitting the boat. I think the example that you're touching on there illustrates this potential challenge. In a world in which you will see worsening impacts, in which there will be greater food shocks, there will be greater fears at least over forced displacement, migration, and so on, it could encourage the types of politics or the ways of doing or not doing international cooperation that may hinder the transition, that may start to mean that countries are increasingly distracted by worsening crises, or maybe even just simply overwhelmed, or they elect certain nativist, eco-nativist politicians, we could call them, but you say, do you know what? Of course we believe in the science, right? But liberal elites knew this, they failed you, and now the world is broken. And we're the only people who protect you from it because we'll put up the walls and we'll patrol the, the seaways and stop people from coming to take what's left. Moments of dislocation crisis, of course, also present opportunities for rapid change. Like I was saying earlier, that moments of rapid policy change have often come, positive policy change often come from points of greatest peril and so on. So yes, in, in a world, a warmer world, more envi environmentally stressed world, we could see all sorts of threats, but also opportunities to driving a rapid transition to more equitable and sustainable societies. And we've got to start thinking in those terms. We're in a we're kind of entering a new era now. We've got to think in terms of the challenge of navigating out of the storm when we're in it, instead of just the challenge of navigating around it. I can see where you want to drive this conversation, like towards, no, but it's true, you know, like thinking about how this is a moment of opportunity and all of this kind of thing. And I yeah. like, I really do agree with you. And I think that that is such an important rhetoric. Um, but I kind of also want to get into like, this idea of um, opportunity coming in moments of crisis and the example you gave at the end of World War II, there was an enemy. There was an enemy who was sort of an equal and opposite then. Like right now we have an enemy which is amorphous, which isn't particularly a thing, which is of our own doing. The enemy is sort of not to go Jungian on everybody, but our shadow self. <laughs> and you know, it demands such international cooperation. Has cooperation like that ever happened without the face of a concrete enemy with whom we can relate and differentiate? And do we need sort of, I don't know, the international core or the UN or an international body to step up and sort of start dictating or demanding or, you know, because we see Antonio or what's his name, the head, you know, the head of the Secretary Terrorist. General of the UN. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Secretary General of the UN it practically in tears on podiums every week, speaking with such passion 
and knowledge about the crisis. And yet this international body is sort of feckless in the face of having no genuine political power. I mean, do we need that now? Would that be a way to navigate through the storm? I think in an ideal world, yes, you would have stronger international level bodies like the UN. The UN used to be far stronger as a forum, say, in the 1960s. I mean, 60 years almost to the day that we, to the weeks, few weeks that we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was a much stronger institution then in helping handle that moment of high tension. Um, but the, it, it doesn't seem so realistic in this moment of dislocation and competition that you're talking about that that may emerge. And I strongly agree with you. It's in some ways amazing to see Antonio Guterres running around saying the things he's doing. In other ways, it's a sort of sign that they're not having as much impact as we'd like them to have. The one thing I would say, though, is that a lot of those institutions emerged, you know, the, the international institutions were created by groups of national, you know, by national groups, by individual countries that were working together. And looking back into why that happened gets us to think about the certain incentives facing groups of countries internationally. It, after the destruction of the Second World War and the requirement for better protections globally that that led a lot of these countries to come together and create institutions like the united nations it was also the the, the wall street crash that led them to create certain economic institutions as well they basically realized let me put it like this they realized that it was only really by cooperating that they could choke off threats that threatened everyone that no one could really hide from the threats of international economic crisis, the threats of huge international wars that sucked everyone into them. And we're in a kind of similar moment now. So a lot of people lament, say, the trees that sit behind COP, like the Paris Agreement, right? Because they're not enforceable. No international body, no sort of international police person is able to turn around and be like, right, you didn't meet your commitments, out. Hmm. That's a problem. But because it was unrealistic to get everyone to sign a treaty that probably had a kind of international police person policing over them, the Paris Agreement had to do a kind of sidestep and say, well, okay, let's use a different measure. The legal element will be that everyone has to turn up with a plan. Now, we won't be able to enforce that plan. We won't be able to say, oh, country A over here has every year come with their plan of how they reduce emissions, but then they've done it, right? We can't enforce, we can't force them to get better at it. But the fact that they have to report a plan that it's transparent what they're doing, then provides an opportunity for people to create expectations and norms about what those countries do. And that's kind of what's then happened because things like climate protesters, Fridays for Future Extinction Rebellion, the vast tapestry of people across the global south has then stepped up to create those kind of pressures. Now, it's overall not working so far, but there's just been relative increase in, in progress as time has gone on. Basically, we've got to work with those kind of incentives that make countries understand that they have to cooperate or else the worsening destabilization that's created will overcome us all. Can we talk concretely about the kind of um, progress that has been made? Because I think for many people, if you were to ask them, what's going on? Is the, are we in a better or worse position five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago with the climate crisis? I think people genuinely wouldn't know. There's a lot of conflicting information um, and it's a, lot of, it's a lot of information just full stop as well. So what we, as far as I understand, this is my job, but as far as I understand, um, we are in a slightly better position than we were a decade or so ago. We have managed to sort of bring a warming down from a runaway five uh, to, you know, possibly under three. Um, and yet by the same token, the exponential curve of emissions is sort of growing and um yes it's hard to tell Is, yeah. are things better are we are we are we on track just not there fast enough or are we on the wrong track so there's been a uh, relative progress but absolute failure so as you said mm. if you if you go back to say cop 21 which was the one in paris in 2015 where this big agreement got signed the promises that countries were making were projected to lead to, yeah, like a five degree temperature rise by the end of the century. By COP26 in Glasgow last year, that had been revised down to somewhere in the mid two, sort of 2.5 or something. So there's, you know, relative progress there, but it's still the absolute failure of 
limiting of, of reducing emissions and limiting warming potentially heating overall to 1.5 degrees so and uh, you know this this was never going to be done by swapping dirty technology for clean alternatives this was always going to have to be done by making huge changes to all of the systems in our lives how we move how we eat how we build and, and live and work and so on and so forth and that was that's always going to be a very long contested struggle for change. I mean, ultimately, it's a struggle of, of all different intersecting movements. The, the movements to realize, to stop the environmental crisis from overcoming the world is the same type of struggle that's needed to reduce inequality, to deal with the yeah. huge colonial injustices that we've seen over the last 300 years. So the, it's like the biggest battle ever, basically. And um, <laughs> we are in... The, period now where we have still got absolute levels of failure in that struggle but we do have some relative progress but are those promises that are being made or are those promises that are being fulfilled um uh, well yeah so this is the problem that we've reached now i think which is that there are huge everyone has made a promise now pretty much everyone's got a net zero target everyone is saying yes we need to keep 1.5 alive it's been a huge struggle to get people there, to get them to sign up for some type of target. I mean, we didn't necessarily have that before. Now we're in the question about delivery mm. and about what policies will actually credibly get us there. And that's where we need to go beyond what is kind of the mainstream approach to doing this, which is to say, well, basically everything's kind of all right, but we just need to swap dirty stuff for clean stuff, electric cars, uh, sorry, pet petrol and diesel cars for electric cars. Uh, planes for electric planes and so on and so forth. And markets will kind of do that for us mm. into something that's much bigger, that's much more honest about the huge transformations that need to occur, you know? Okay. Could you walk us through some of the policies that we would need to see on sort of the national and international level? Um, and then I will, I recognize I did ask you to talk about debt and then took the conversation away from there. So we'll see if we can swing back into that as well. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that one then. I was at a, a gathering the other day uh, of uh, brought, to, brought together by one of the leading environmental charities in the UK. And I, in that group, I said, guys, look, we've been talking a lot about electric vehicles, about looking after rivers and so on. Those things are hugely important. They're kind of like the outcomes that we need, though. What's the things that enable them? Mm. And right now in the UK, and this is the UK here, actually, I think is a really good example uh, for people all around the world, probably the big, I would say one of the biggest environmental policy issues right now that people should be concerned about is the fact that the government is saying we've got this massive fiscal black hole and we need to fill it. And we're going to have to fill that by raising taxes or and or reducing spending. And I would love it, I actually said this to a, a, a protest the other day, a protester the other day, it's up to them to work out the framing on this one, but if, if some of the protests we were seeing were, sure, about how bad the environmental crisis is and the fact that we need to stop oil and gas, that's absolutely right. Alongside that, it'd be great to see some protesting that said, one of the biggest environmental issues is that the government, and again, it's up to people to work out the best frame of this, has a fiscal rule that says the debt to GDP ratio must be going down over a three year period. So the government has this rule that basically says, look, the amount of debt that the government has got needs to be reducing, however slowly, but on the way down as a ratio of its GDP at some point in the next three years, right? So let's say, you know, you're, you're, you're basically the amount of debt per the size of your economy. And the reason why it's got that is basically assurance for the people that lend the country money saying, look, we've got a plan to ultimately pay you back because you've lent us some money, right? And that's important to have that. But the, the thing with these rules is, is if you said, there's no, there's no, no one has said that. There's no supreme being who said, by the way, the physical law of fiscal policy is that you have to have the debt to GDP ratio decreasing over a three year period. It's a political construct. So someone could come along and be like, well, can't, well, can't it just be reducing over five years or 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And that would be fine. And what that would do is it would mean that this massive fiscal hole would just disappear because it only exists as a result of the, the horizon that you map. If you say, well, it's going to go down in five years' time, and the economy, GDP might be a bit bigger in five years' time, then suddenly you don't have a hole that you've got to fill. And for me, this, this, this is quite techy, but this is very important. Because if we're in a situation 
where we think that every now and again we have to choke off spending because the credit card has been maxed out. Mm. Then we're not going to get the massive public investments we need to deal with the environmental crisis. So those kind of things, that, the ability for government to spend the scale of money that we need, that is a key environmental battleground. So, but what is that political construct holding the back? Is it in order to attract more investment into the UK, i.e. to show that people get their money back within a shorter time frame? It, so at the moment in the UK, the reason why they're fixating on this is because the Conservative Party, the, the party that's governed for the last 12 years, uh, introduced a set of economic policies a few weeks ago that... Which um, ones? Sorry. Were... <laughs> The, one, the ones where they said they were going to give vast tax breaks to the very wealthiest and they were going to borrow money to pay for it yeah, yeah, yeah. and that they weren't going to allow anyone to look at their songs on how they were proposing that. So the, the people that were lending money to the government were just like, this is mad. In the same way that if, you know, I, if I went to a bank manager and was like, look, I want to take out a decent sized loan and, you know, you got me. I'm a very credible guy. And then the next minute they saw me running around, absolutely drunk off my face, sort of chucking this money around. They'd be like, mm, this guy probably isn't so credible. So the government right now is trying to make up for that kind of uh, the, the very uncredible way it approached its, uh, its, its policies. So it's trying to kind of um, go on some kind of desperate, overcorrective, recredibility, like establishing its mm. credibility by saying, look, look, we've got this rule. We're not going to change it. And we're going to cut loads of stuff back so we meet our own rule. But the people that lend the British government money are not demanding that. They're just demanding some assurance that they will ultimately get their money in the future. In fact, if the British government turned around and said, do you know what? A new government say came along that wasn't associated with the disaster of what the recent government has just done and said, we are actually going to borrow quite a lot of money over the next, say, five years. We were going to spend it on all of these investments to insulate people's homes, to make sure that people can affordably switch from a petrol and diesel vehicle and then deliver all this renewable energy. And we're doing that because it will make the country more secure. It will make it more prosperous. People are going to lend money to a government that's, that's delivering that kind of mm. plan. As long as it fits within, you know, you could have a new, we say, look, we've got a new rule. It's that we will reduce debt to GDP over a 10-year period, say. And so it, it's these kind of things that need to be on the front line of environmentalism, really. They're environmental policies at the end of the day. I think there's important context to add on top of that. And I would love to, I'd love to know if you think it's important too. Also this week, um, a coalition of fossil fuel companies published, wrote to and published their letter to the government um, saying that, um, ah, what was it? That the, the United Kingdom is one of the most fiscally insecure um, place in countries to operate right now and that the, you know the government essentially needs to sort it out which is astonishing given that they have just experienced windfall um, record-breaking profits um, and have not been taxed appropriately for that thing so like whatever they are complaining about god knows exactly so given what you've just described is um, very not only environmentally friendly but fiscally sound investing in the future investing in technologies mm -hmm. that people are interested in, investing in your labor force so that they um, can heat their homes and feed their children. And also maybe we'll vote you back in if you look after them um, and no. all this kind of thing versus refusing to acknowledge the genuine problems that we face and refusing to acknowledge the future that is coming for us, whether we like it or not. It just seems like really stupid policy making. And therefore, what is the pressure that is on the government that is making them make these bad decisions or take these bad decisions? Well, the, 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 well, the government will be doing these things partly because the people in it have not internalised the idea that things like fiscal policy, things like austerity and the deficit and so on, that those are directly related to environmental issues. That, I can tell you, is, is not in the mainstream mm. mind of politicians and policymakers. They also want to do some of these things because there is a ideological commitment to shrinking the state. Mm -hmm. um, this has been something that has plagued us for decades now, that anything the government does is counterproductive, that when government spends money in the economy or doing things in the economy, it gets in the way of private companies. Instead of the reality, which is that when governments spend, it often stimulates 
prosperity and investment opportunities for other companies. You know, if yeah. you, um, the prime example of this is, is, the, is the American government saying, well, we want to spend some money to get someone on the moon. It just created vast opportunities <laughs> for companies to step in and say, oh, amazing. What a challenge. We'll invent this thing, this thing, this thing. Yeah. And the, so, but there's an ideological commitment to, to shrinking uh, the state. And a lot of people will make a lot of money from, for example, the, 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 uh, if the government steps back from providing more healthcare in the UK, it's another good example. Well, the UK is a good example because its healthcare system is largely public. If, if the government's not providing it, then it's an opportunity for a private company mm. to provide it, a profitable opportunity. And they know that if you're providing the healthcare as a private company, because it's so important for the country, at the end of the day, it's too big to fail. If you fail, the government will step in and kind of bail you out because it's a critical service, like we've seen with the trains. When private companies have failed over and over again to deliver reliable train services, the government has to step in and be like, well, we're going to have to pick up the piece here because at the end of the day, people need train transport. So all of these things are the, the reasons why governments are not doing it right now. There's a huge opportunity for politicians and policymakers to step in and say, actually, things like fiscal policy, public finances, debt and deficit, how much the government spends and borrows and taxes and so on. Those are important things related to environmental crisis. And the last thing I'll say on this is that the, the Office of Budget Responsibility, the, the, the sort of independent body in the UK that's supposed to uh, uh, look over the government's plans for how it spends money, released a report, I think it was last year, maybe even the year before, that said one of, if not the biggest threat to public finance in the UK, to governments all over the world, is the climate crisis because it will start to impose such vast costs on the country yeah. that governments just won't be able to keep up with the spending they'll need to manage it. And by the way, the quicker government spends big to deal with them, the less those costs will be in the future. And there's an astonishing line in that report that says something along the lines of, ultimately, if you don't get your handle on top of this, there won't be any public finances because the crisis will be so destructive. So there's a big opportunity here for, for people to step in and say, yeah, the things like public finances, these are environmental issues. Mm. Do you get to speak to policymakers? Yes. Right. What's up with them? Well, I, <laughs> you know, the, uh, they, they now, I tell you what, they, they now, okay. Look, there are different uh, types of them. There are some that are just, completely out of touch they essentially come in from a different era and they have certain ideological ideological pursuits they want to sort of get rid of the government for its own sake and so on there's a kind of um so the messy middle of people who are you know they are politicians they will be directed by the winds of what they think voters want and if that wind is blowing in the direction of wanting action on the environmental crisis then they will respond however much politicians have failed to deliver the absolute progress that we need there has been a relative change in what they care about. Since the Extinction Rebellion occupation of London in April 2019, there has been a real big shift towards recognition that there is this concern. What's next is they need uh, to be pushed on a very specific set of policies. So we need to get more specific. It's, it's rare that I would say to people, you know, you need to get more specific, more techy about the policy, because in some ways, I guess, we do need that. You know, there, there is, as far as I'm concerned, there aren't many people, for example, who are making politicians who are either working in the Treasury or those kind of finance departments or aspire to work in them because they're in opposition, who are feeling the pressure coming from activist groups, uh, campaigners, their constituents and so on, who are being like, you need to change the fiscal rules or you need to have this different attitude towards public finances because if you don't well the government's not going to step up to handle this crisis so they this sort of messy middle of people who could be shifted who aren't the absolute diehard ideologues but also aren't the people who are absolutely committed mm. like for example green politicians and so on they need that relentless pressure that makes them think well you know i want to be in the treasury but clearly everyone wants me to behave in this way and i will be punished as a politician electorally or so on if i don't sign up to these kind of ideas this is fascinating. It's all, it's all everything that you've been saying over the past sort of forty five minutes is starting to click into place. So the climate crisis is a, in many ways, a fiscal problem, um, and we have a huge what well, we have a more power to deal with it than we think we do by sort of reimagining our fiscal responsibility or the fiscal rules by which we play. 
Yeah. Yes. Let me, I mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis earlier, and I only mentioned it because it was 60 years ago that this was happening. Mm -hmm. um, the, the US president at the time, uh, John Kennedy, was obsessed with the idea of agency. One of his favorite books would have been released a few months before the Cuban Missile Crisis called The Guns of August. And it's about the lead up to the First World War, about the August in 1914 leading up to the beginning of the First World War. And he was obsessed with bits of that book that talked about how a lot of the politicians in France and Germany and Britain and Russia and so on at the beginning of the First World War were kind of compelled by a momentum that was bigger than themselves. It was, oh, well, we're in a treat with that country, so if this happens, then mm -hmm. we have to do this. And, oh, we've already dispatched a large number of troops on trains, so that means that that's already happened. And this kind of momentum grew that became bigger than the ability of individual politicians to have agency over them. Kennedy was concerned about this in the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis because he was afraid that if there were nuclear weapons on Cuba, which America... Uh, wanted to to be wanted to be taken away, so they introduced a blockade to stop ships. If an American shot the ship, then Russia would respond in kind somewhere else, which then means America would respond, and you could go all the way up the escalation ladder to a nuclear war. And Kennedy was obsessed with the idea that that kind of momentum could sap away his agency. Mm. In the present day, we are in a situation right now where our agency over the environmental crisis, our ability to reduce emissions, repair harms, and ultimately stop the worst from happening is still very, very strong. Right now, if governments got rid of their, uh, you know, feelings about spending money and made investments and we mobilize societies in the way we need, we would be able to arrest that environmental crisis. But there will be a moment where our agency is overtaken by that kind of inexorable momentum. And unlike those other examples of that momentum being grown by different people in different countries, it will come from tipping points, non-linear changes in the environment. Basically, it will create self-fulfilling processes of change. We are not there yet. And that's, to be honest, the primary reason why we need an emergency response globally is to protect and then deepen our agency over the environmental crisis before an unstoppable momentum of environmental change begins. We're not there yet. We may be, but that itself is very empowering because we have extraordinary agency that we can bring to bear over this now. Gosh, what a rousing speech. I can feel it in my knees. <laughs> no, really, that was absolutely amazing. <laughs> and what I find so interesting about that, where you're talking about tipping points, is there is that technical term. Um, is it cascading? Cas uh, cascading, yeah. right, okay. And this idea that uh, once you go past a certain point in, you know, with the physical laws of the universe and with the interconnected you know, ecosystem of the entire planet, it will, you just won't be able to stop it at that point. It will run away with us. And that idea as well that politically there will be, the, there could be this cascade of like being pulled along by one's own rhetoric rather than having agency over to, yes. to stop it. It's fascinating. But there's, there's also then a, a positive version of that, which is that countries become increasingly, countries become increasingly concerned, begin to increasingly make targets and promises. And then voters and everyone pressures them to fulfill those targets, which means that they have to introduce policies that unleash government spending, unleash regulation and government investment, then means that we start to bend the emissions curve, which then means that more opportunities. So there is, a, there is that process of, of, of constructive feedback yeah. that picks up a momentum in the same way that you get that destructive version we were talking about. I tell you, if you turn around to me in 2018, summer 2018, you were like, look, within the space of the next 12 months, we will see a, a global movement of school kids who are striking. We will see occupations of major cities around the world. We'll see countries signing up to net zero. We'll see um, solar PV manufacturers mm. invest in a supply chain that will ultimately deliver one eighth of global electricity supply created in solar panels a year within the next few years. I'd be like, this is wild. Sure, in my wildest dreams, great. But it shows you the momentum that's building up. Now, mm. to say that that momentum, that those constructive changes are happening is not to say the job is done. In fact, it's quite the opposite. But we should be empowered. You know, that in the same way that destructive feedbacks can overwhelm us and lead to a collapse in our abilities, in our agency, these constructive changes and our frustration that they're not good enough should drive an expansion of our agency. What a great and critical moment, I think, to, to end on, Maury. 
Um, thank you so much. My final question for you is who would you like to platform? Uh, so I would like to platform uh, Shristi Bajpai, who is uh, a core, one of the core members of the global ta tapestry, sorry, of alternatives. She's someone I met very briefly over this summer, but her work and the work of the global tapestry is something that's always been a massive inspiration for me, particularly as someone in the UK who doesn't, through day-to-day -day work facing UK policymakers, get to see enough of what those real constructive that constructive agency looks like more in the global south perspective and indeed international perspective so it's to shristi that i would like to give a heads up on wicked laurie thank you so much that's my pleasure if you want to learn more about laurie's work i've put links to everything in the description box below remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it if you loved it support planet critical on patreon where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview the patreon link is in the description box below as always thank you to the planet critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible thank you all for listening i'll see you next week